Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Brendan Cole. Now, last week, the European Union met to discuss Belarus, hinting that more sanctions could be imposed on Minsk soon. The meeting came after Belarus expelled Sweden's ambassador, with some linking it to a publicity stunt last month where planes from Sweden dropped teddy bears carrying freedom of speech messages. Belarus denies that this incident was linked to the expulsion. That in part stems from policies taken by Alexander Lukashenko, who has been president of the former Soviet country since 1994. The EU has already imposed a series of sanctions on Minsk for its crackdown on members of the Belarus political opposition. In January 2011, the EU reinstated a travel ban against Alexander Lukashenko after the government detained opposition supporters in the wake of elections that were disputed. Some 250 Belarus government and court officials have also been banned from travelling to to EU countries. So what is Belarus's relationship like with the EU? Will it get better or worse? It's signed a trade and customs deal with Russia and Kazakhstan. Does this signal that it's turning more towards Moscow than the EU in the future? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Yaroslav Krivoy. He's the editor of BelarusDigest.com. Also with me in the studio is Yana Kobzova, who's an analyst from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Over the phone, we've got Katia Glod. She's a Robert Bosch fellow at the Chatham House think tank in London. And also on the phone is Horia Victor Lefter, our independent analyst on Central and Eastern Europe. Yaroslav Krivoy, do you think Belarus Belarus has overreacted by expelling the Swedish diplomats. I certainly do think so. And uh, it will not, in the long run, I think it will hurt Belarus. But the authorities were trying to send a message that uh, that no one is supposed to play with them. So if you're trying to play games with us, we're going to react harshly. In the long run, and even in the short run, it, it will be it will do more harm to the, the government than, uh, than good because it limits its options by making the rela- its relations with the European Union even worse. Katia Glod, you're from Minsk. Do you think, what, what, what was your view when uh, Belarus expelled the Swedish diplomat? Well, I think that basically the teddy bear drop was more a pretext that the government used to expel the Swedish ambassador. Um, Belarusian government has been quite unhappy with uh, Ambassador Ericsson because indeed he felt very much at home in Belarus. He speaks perfect Belarusian and uh, perhaps it's Sweden has been the um, country in Belarus which has done the most for the development of civil society, uh, for the development of uh, opposing voices. Uh, um, Sweden has been carrying out really a lot of projects in Belarus. And I think that was, you know, just the pretext that uh, the Belarusian government used. Uh, Whether that was an um, emotional stance, well, yes, to some extent it is, as, you know, Lukashenko can react in whatever way he wishes. He's very predictable. But this particular expulsion, I think it had been pre-planned. Uh, Jana Kubsova, I'll turn to you. The situation does smack a little bit of um, Matthias Rust's landing on Red Square in 1987. I mean, it is a breach of diplomatic protocol with planes flying into uh, foreign airspace. Um, uh, Belarus's reaction isn't too over the top, is it? I actually agree with uh, with Katya and what uh, with what Eric said. Even if you compare it to the situation in eighteen uh, was in nineteen eighty seven. Eighty seven, yeah. Um, um, you know, there was nothing like that, and it's it's even more striking that, in fact, what they've done, they uh, the the Swedes have just uh, dropped teddy bears. You know, they didn't drop bombs. They didn't violate. Um, anything but Belarus. But it is quite cheeky, isn't it? It's a, it's a facetious statement and of quite political intent. Um, they, they can't have expected there to be no consequences of that, could they? True, but at the same time, I think the government of Belarus fails to distinguish between private actions and the state-backed actions. The, the embassy and the organizers of the flight were very consistently saying this was not coordinated. Uh, this was not prepared in cooperation with the Swedish embassy. The Swedish ambassador had nothing to do with it apart from the fact that they were informed that this might happen because the Swedes planned to land or seek the, uh, seek the refuge in the Swedish embassy in case something goes wrong. And I just don't see why the state of Sweden is being res- made responsible for actions of private individuals from Sweden. Uh, Yaroslav, Yaroslav Krivoy, the Mintz claims that Sweden or the Swedish ambassador had been meeting with opposition figures and spending more time with them than with the Belarusian government. And the job of the, the, job of the diplomat 
uh, is is to increase ties, Swedish Belarusian ties, and they weren't doing that. I think it's very telling that the Swedish ambassador was meeting more with the opposition people and with those who are a part of the Belarusian civil society rather than with the government officials, and it's consistent with the European Union policy towards Belarus, and they try to distinguish between actions of the government, actions of of the Belarusian regime, and actions of the society at large. And so they're trying to focus their efforts on working with people directly, with political parties, with uh, civil society organizations, with charities, uh, bypassing the government, because uh, there is there are not that many programs which are currently underway between the, the government of Belarus and European Union countries. But the there are plenty of programs which work with with, with with civil society. So it's not unusual that uh, that in any country for any ambassador to meet with political parties, representatives, with civil society actors. And it's even less unusual in Belarus where the official ties between the government of Belarus and, and the European Union countries' governments are very restricted. This is a, an unjustifiable meeting of opposition minds or, or what? I think, as Eric said, it's normal for the diplomats to meet everyone, not just the government. But the point I wanted to make is that Sweden and other countries have been consistently trying to reach out to the Belarusian government. It's not that they only talk to the opposition. The trouble in Belarus is that the government of Belarus is not interested in talking to the diplomats about anything else but business. And that's what has been the problem. It's not that Sweden is not trying to reach out to the government officials. It's that the only thing they're open to talk about is business, which Sweden and other EU members are not ready to do. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the political situation in Belarus. With me is Yaroslav Krivoy, editor of BelarusDigest.com. Yana Kabzova, analyst for the European Council on Foreign Relations. On the line is Katia Glod, the Robert Bosch Fellow from the Russia and Eurasia Programme at Chatham House, and Horia Victor Lefter, an independent analyst on Central and Eastern Europe. Horia Victor Lef- Lefter, I'll turn to you. How significant do you think this incident of, uh, of the teddy bears is in terms of European Union and Belarusian relations? If one takes into account the EU statement, the last on the August 10th, if one takes that into account uh, in, in the statement, uh, they are only um, showing the elements to, that they will be taken into account uh, for the next uh, revision of the restrictive measures, but they do not uh, indicate any measures that is going to be taken. But um, according to some EU um, officials, there might be economic or financial um, measures, sanctions. So there can be some impact, but... Um, it is difficult to say whether uh, the, all ambassadors will be taken out from the um, call back from the country uh, to the EU's capital. Katya Glod uh, from Chatham House. Um, th- there was a point when actually Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, did care about what the EU thought. There were reports, I think, about three or four years ago that he'd hired a, a London-based public relations firm. Well, I think in the past, indeed, the situation was a little bit different. Lukashenko did try to come to terms with the European Union, mainly um, uh, for economic uh, reasons, um, to get certain benefits from this relationship. It's not at all that he, uh, in the past, you know, all of a sudden started to share the same ideology with the European Union. He never would respect the European values, but he did try, you know, just for economic terms, when the relations with Russia went, um, you know, went downhill, when Belarus was not able to obtain cheap oil, in particular, as it, you, as it was able to in the past, and then Lukashenko started, you know, thinking a little bit more, you know, towards the worst. But, you know, once the um, uh, um, common economic space uh, between Belarus, Russia and Kazakhstan went into play, went into force, and Lukashenko received uh, the support from the Russian leader, so, you know, he is kind of does not care again about what, you know, the European Union will think of him because, you know, he's got, you know, all the cheap energy prices he wanted to. Um, the conditions that the Russians gave him under the auspicious of the common economic economic space, common economic area are very lucrative and, you know, they're very good. The trade balance between Belarus and Russia has um, improved again. And basically, you know, there is also political support coming from Putin. So Lukashenko feels very much at home with how the situation is um, with the European Union at the moment. What kind of, what would be the most significant piece of advice that um, Lukashenko took from from a Western public relations firm? Some uh, were saying that the fact that he's bringing his seven-year-old... Boyle 
everywhere was kind of an advance he, ta- you know, he took from, from the West, you know, to kind of portray him uh, as a more a human person. Um, I don't know if that actually plays positive. I think people in Belarus actually, on the contrary, a little bit dislike this town. So, so Yaroslav Kravoy, not a particularly effective public relations campaign, and in fact um, the standing of Belarus has, has gone down significantly in the, in the last three or four years, hasn't it? I think the moment when the when Belarusian image and reputation started to deteriorate was uh, December 19th, 2010, when the government dispersed uh, a large group of uh, people who came out to protest against the, what they saw as unfair elections. And st- so starting then, when, when the president, or when, the, when the regime imprisoned uh, most of uh, opposition presidential candidate, candidates and in addition a number of other people. I think the advice which they, I'm not sure about, about the, the, the particular you know, tips which, they, which were given to them by, by this Western uh, PR company, but I imagine that they would say try to be predictable, try to be nice, try to, uh, you know, not, uh, try to play, to look as though you are playing by the rules. Yaroslav refers there to the elections of 2010, the disputed elections and um, the protests that subsequently followed. Lukashenko was actually offered some kind of carrot for a fair election, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, what happened before the elections was a series of measures which sort of warmed the relationship between the EU and um, and Belarus. A uh, number of political prisoners were released and the EU was really keen on continuing this dialogue, saying the presidential elections in December 2010 would be the benchmark. A month before that, the, the German and Polish foreign ministers travelled to Minsk And they basically explicitly made an offer to the president saying, you know, there is an assistance available up to four billion dollars, sorry, euros, uh, that is available for you in case the elections will be free. Uh, Now, the sort of, there is a combination of factors, you know, one would argue that the pre-election campaign was much freer, if not free, um, than, than all the previous presidential elections that took place under Lukashenko's regime. What, however, happened, as Yaroslav said, was that the crackdown that happened on the election night was something that hasn't happened before on such a scale. There may be a number of motives why he did it. Um, I think one of them was that the relationship with Russia has improved just before the elections. He didn't really feel the need to to go into great length in terms of pleasing the EU. He was counting on the EU accepting the results as it was I don't think they expected that such harsh reactions has happened, which was that the EU, as you mentioned at the beginning, imposed a number of travel bans and economic sanctions. What we should be looking at in the moment when it comes to the EU's relationship with Belarus is not only the teddy bear incident, it's, it's the parliamentary elections that are going to happen in September. When you look at the, the overall relationship between the EU and Belarus, uh, what comes up as a factor that you just can't ignore or, or not including the calculation is always Russia. And I think if you look at the sort of past couple of years, that has become much more prominent. Katia Glod from Chatham House. But there has been quite considerable spats between Minsk and Moscow, especially over gas. Not always a, it's not always been a rosy relationship. It's always been one of tension, hasn't it? You're right, absolutely. So the relationship has not been a rosy one, but it has improved significantly. I think once uh, uh, Lukashenko realised that he is in this sort of bundle together with Russia in Kazakhstan um, to move from, you know, the customs Union through the common economic area to the Eurasian Union, he kind of a little bit calmed down, if you wish, in a sense that he managed to get the most what he wanted from this uh, um, new institutional relationship. And as long as that is guaranteed, which so far it seems to be guaranteed for in the next several years, he's happy because that's basically the basics of his regime. The, the, the relationship has improved from the Belarusian side, but um, by the same token, it has improved from the the Russian side, because Russia it sees it as now a big, you know, grand goal to kind of, you know, um, set up a new institution uh, where Russia would, you know, dominate, where it would be the center of power. And Lukashenko was not a very, um, you know, easy play in this game. Uh, Horia Victor Lefta, I'll, I'll turn to you. We're talking about the customs union. Uh, what's the thinking behind the customs union with Russia? Because Russia, after all, it's part of the WTO. How, how significant is this a trade deal? Is this more of a political deal than a trade deal? It has a, a political uh, meaning, but um, the fact that Russia got, got into WTO and Kazakhstan will get that a bit later uh, this year, 
It might have an impact on, on Russia-Belarus uh, trade relation. It might damage their relations, but not at, uh, at such a point that would be uh, catastrophic. Indeed. Um, Yaroslav Kravoy, Belarus, as I said, is a gas, gas transit nation for Russian energy, but in the in the in the near future or in the long term future, we have the Nord Stream project. Belarus will become less important for Russia. So surely these the, the, this the strength of backing from Russia can't last, can it? I think it's likely to last as long as Russia as as long as oil prices remain high. Because for uh, for Russia, the political component of this union is much more important than its economic component. So uh, while Be- for Belarus, for, 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 for Lukashenko, the economic component is much more important. So whatever uh, Russia likes, he, he would be happy to do as long as they pay him. Uh, but for Russia, uh, you know, they can pay and they can pay generously as long as you know, Lukashenko is playing, uh, playing the game. So I think that uh, the ge- geostrategical, geopolitical considerations are more important for Russia, and I don't. I do not think that they will change. So these, so these kind of tiffs, these little spats that we see over gas, for instance, two years ago, they're, they're, they're easily resolved. I think that as a result of those quarrels between Belarus and Russia, Belarus is losing more and more. For and and it, it's a very gradual process. But they're losing more, let's say, state-owned enterprises to 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 Russian businesses. They're losing more people who who immigrate to Russia. So it's a long process. A lot of the European Union criticism of Belarus has been its human rights record. Last month, um, there was a journalist who was indicted on a charge of libel against the country's president after he published articles that questioned the execution of of the two men that were uh, found uh, guilty of the Minsk bombings. Is this kind of um, case common, Yannick Observer? The regime has been consistently trying to control what's out there in the media. Uh, There is no secret that there are actually no uh, publicly owned media in Belarus that would be independent. Uh, what the regime can't really control is the is the news that come from internet, um, and what they're trying to do by punishing the journalists, like the one you mentioned, is basically to show that uh, that even those who are writing on internet are not um, immune to prosecution. What they don't want to see is basically a public debate in Belarus about what's going on and what are the solutions. Katia Glod, how much is Belarusian society resisting this, though? Well, it's um, it's been very hard for Belarusian society to resist these practices of the authorities because, indeed, the regime is very harsh. Just to give you another example, I'm talking about our teddy bear drop, which is a bit overlooked. Um, the fact that there are two Belarusians who are currently being in prison for, um, for basically they're facing charges for participating in the teddy bear drop and they may face up to seven years in prison. One person is the blogger who posted the photographs and the other person is just a real estate agent who just rented, rented out the flat to the, Swedish, um, to the Swedish PR company. And this is just to show you how basically aggressive the regime can be and therefore it would be very difficult for the Belarusian society to resist it. There was uh, some hope for people, you know, after the 2010 presidential election, when people were very unhappy with, you know, the massive arrests. And further on uh, in March 2011, with the nearly threefold depreciation of the Belarusian currency, of the Belarusian ruble, people would want to protest. Um, Yaroslav Kravoy, the clapping protests last year made a significant impression, I think, in the West. Did they have much of a long-term effect? The clapping protests were visible not only in the West but also inside Belarus because information, for those who are seeking independent information in Belarus, they can easily get it. They can just turn on turn on, turn on internet. No, most Belarusians know that it, it happened. But those people who came out, they were not really... Uh, you know, the, the hardcore, uh, ordinary Belarusians. These were huge, most of them were, uh, were young people, and then, and the numbers were not that significant. If we compare those protests with what was happening in 1960s when, you know, over 60,000 people came out to the streets and the regime used it, uh, those protests as an opportunity to demonstrate how they can punish whoever tries to uh, you know, to show that they that that they disagree with the regime publicly. So it's 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 all right to disagree with the regime privately, and people can talk about it, and so no one is going to be arrested for it. But if you are trying to organize people, if you are trying to create you know a public nuisance, then that they will uh, crack down on it. the The problem with uh, with many Belarusian opposition organizations is that they they no longer 
uh, have or they never had real people on the ground. So people in small towns or people in the capital who were able and uh, to do work. So many uh, protests and or and may, or many activities just shift to internet. So instead of working with people, uh, uh, activists write articles, they blog, they post pictures, which does not really affect the the, the population at large. You're listening to the Voice of Russia. My guests on this discussion on Belarus: Yaroslav Kravoy, Yana Kobzova, Katya Glod and Horia Victor Lefter. Horia Victor Lefter, I suppose central to any kind of opposition to, in a, in, and how it pans out in Belarus is the economic situation of the country. Um, what's the state of the Belarusian economy now? It's not that good. Um, um, in the last, in the July 10th memorandum, the World Bank um, turned towards Belarus and told um, that uh, the economic growth model that Belarus has implemented for uh, over the past 10 years. It's reached its limits because it's based on energy resources from Russia um, and uh, Russia subsidies for Belarus that uh, reached annual levels of 13% of the GDP. So um, for the past three years, Belarus has suffered two economic crises. They are constantly devaluating uh, the Belarus currency in 2009 by 20%. Um, I guess you have a catch-22 because for there to be any kind of economic reforms of Belarus, you need political reforms, don't you? What is the potential of Belarus? In terms of economic potential, the, the potential is obviously huge. Uh, but as Victor said, the, the problem that the country has are enormous. Uh, one of them is... Um, the salaries have gone down. Uh, the average salary last time I checked was around $200. Um, that's, that's not enough for Belarus either, uh, especially when the regime has been consistently promising that those salaries will rise up to $500 a month. That doesn't mean um, that Belarus is going to go bankrupt anytime soon, despite the fact that, for example, the currency revel levels or currency reserves levels are really low. The key factor in Belarusian economy is no longer the Belarusian state, it's, it's Russia. And uh, what Russia has shown for past couple of years very consistently is if there is a need for Belarus to get cheap money, if there is a need for Belarus to get money without any conditions or without very few conditions, not necessarily political, which is usually the, the condition that the EU or the international financial institutions would attach to any sort of assistance to Belarus, Russia is very willing to help. Belarus has been consistently the most enthusiastic backer of the customs union and the Eurasian union, that's part of the deal. But the other thing is that uh, Russia has been also trying to increase its own influence in the country in terms of economic presence. They already got the, the chief transit pipeline. So yes, Belarus is an important transit country, but the fact is that at the moment it's Russia which owns the transit pipeline. It's not the Belarusian government anymore. And that's very, very important for Russian own uh, energy exports to the EU. So it has been, it's not sort of the sort of Russia is paying and it gets nothing in return. It is the political support, it's an economic influence and presence in the country, which is still a lucrative market for Russia. Yeah, if, I, if I can just add uh, to, to, to the answer, well, to this point that, uh, when, to this assumption that when salaries go down, then the people are more willing to protest. I think the what we saw over the last two years is that there is no direct correlation and, and even on the contrary, in December 2010 when there was the largest protest after the presidential elections the largest pro pro protest over maybe five, the last five years or, or even more uh, the, the salaries were very very high and when the salaries were low whether at, at their lowest point in, in summer or in autumn of 2011 there were almost no protests and if you look at North Korea at, at, at Iran you see that those people are have been under sanctions for a very long time and then still they're not really protesting so uh, so that so that hence that um, any kind of further sanctions imposed on Minsk on Belarus will be completely ineffective I think there, there will certainly be a an effect, and uh, but this effect is difficult to 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 predict. So on the one hand, Belarus will certainly become more dependent upon Russia because the, it will have to sell even more to to the Russians. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the the population um, they may have to migrate more quickly. Also, the other factor that that we mentioned before is that. Um, for you to start thinking in political terms and become active, you need to have a space for that and you need to have credible actors you can turn to. 
And those two things are currently not really existing in Belarus. What's interesting is that despite the economic situation worsening, the, the, the sort of the trust of the po society to the, towards the opposition has not really increased. So those people who have become disaffected with the regime do not necessarily turn to the opposition. Um, Katia Glod from Chatham House, there is a, a vociferous uh, element that oppose the regime, I suppose. Um, how does this all go well for the future? I think, as I said before, that people are very suppressed at the moment, both politically and economically, and they don't think that, you know, they have the guts at the moment to come um, to take to the street and protest. But what does give me hope, I think that, you know, as paradoxically as it might, you know, sound, the fact that, you know, there is now this common economic area with Russia and Kazakhstan. Well, first of all, Russia. A lot of Belarusians, that they actually, you know, went and are continuing um, going to Russia to look for work. And I think, you know, once people start earning, you know, a little bit better money in Russia, and once they will be in a little bit different environment, and once people will be seeing, you know, this sort of different attitude of, you know, Russian people and how Russian people are trying to articulate their political interests, I think that that might, you you know, a little bit, you know, help people in Belarus to kind of open up and maybe be a little bit more outspoken. So I see some, um, you know, some uh, kind of hope coming from this, you know, labor migration. Yaroslav Kravoy, is there any sense of what would happen post Lukashenko? If Russia will play a very big role in, in whatever happens after Lukashenko. On the other hand, the the model, the, the European model of development, it is much more popular among the Belarusian population than the what is seen as, as a more corrupt model, less transparent model. If the population were given uh, more or less free access to free media for you know for for a year or two, and then they had proper elections, then I think it would result in a very different political situation in Belarus. But the problem is that. Uh, this may not happen because of very strong role of Russia. So most likely they, they would be interested to replace Lukashenko with someone else. And the question is whether someone else who is most certainly um, or most likely is not going to have the same level of charisma and personal appeal. So if someone else, uh, a less uh, bright person comes in and if uh, whether, that, whether this person will be able to be uh, someone, uh, well, whether this person is going to uh, be trusted by by the bureaucracy, by the Belarusian nomenclature, or by those who actually run the country. Because in the abs absence of, of a proper parliament and the absence of proper political institutions, the bureaucracy, the elite plays plays a key role. I don't uh, have any illusions that uh, Lukashenko will be replaced by a free and democratic Belarus because it will take time. The mistake that the Europeans often make is look at Belarus and see only one guy, which is Lukashenko, saying, you know, t you know, if he just went to Russia or some, or you know, just all of a sudden disappeared from the political scene, everything will change. The key to political change is in uh, in the Belarus is the transformation of the whole system, how the system works in terms of economy, but also political political situation. You know. Lukashenko doesn't rule because he's a dictator, he rules because he's able to control all other sections of the society. And, and unless that changes, we can't really expect uh, much in terms of democratic reforms. Would like to, I'd like to thank all my guests, uh, Yaroslav Krivoy, who's editor of BelarusDigest.com, Jana Kabzova, an analyst from the European Council on Foreign Relations, Katia Glod, the Robert Bash Fellow from Chatham House Think Tank in London, and Horia Victor Lefter, an analyst on Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you very much for joining me on The Voice of Russia.